love it when I hear revving engines. Not really, it kind of scares me. Hello everybody, so as most of you already know, the Portland shooter who killed the Trump supporter was caught and killed. So they found him in Washington and was killed by police, according to one of the officers who wants to remain anonymous. Apparently this the killer pulled out a gun against police and was shot as a result. I will let you guys kind of make of that what you will. But I want to give you guys a couple interesting perspectives, one of which is from a Portland protester perspective, kind of how I feel about the situation, and second, as somebody who actually studies extremism. So this might be a little bit longer video, but I think you guys would appreciate it because I'm going to be getting into the psychology of how do does your average Joe become radicalized how does that transform into a society? And then what can we anticipate moving forward? Now, if this provides any sort of credibility, I did predict that this was going to happen. I think it was probably about a month ago or so. So just as a heads up on that. Now, also, I want to kind of get into my biases just for like a half a second. So you know where I stand and I'm not trying to be very shady or anything like that. Okay. Now, I don't support the Republicans and I don't support the Democrat. Pretty much like what I said in a previous video, I support Bernie Sanders. I'm a social Democrat or Democratic Socialist is the mainstream uh, concept, even though it's they're actually messed up. The mainstream concept's messed up. It's it's not actually correct. But anyway, I digress. I'm not a communist like a lot of people would like to apply um, or imply, I should say. You know, that's me. That is me. All my sources are in the description box of each video. So if you're wondering kind of where my spices stand and why do I talk the way that I talk, well, that's why. Moving forward, I'm going to give you guys my direct opinion because I know that's what you guys came for. And then there's some really trippy stuff afterwards. I think overall, it, politics aside, I find this just to be extremely, extremely sad because you have to remember when something like this happens, where, say, let's use the Trump supporter as an example, when he's killed, where does the pain that his family is experiencing go to? Do you think that they're going to be more moderate from this? Well, no. Do you think they're going to support violence against the left now? More than likely, yeah. And I'm going to get into the psychological traits as to why that is. So let's think about the, the larger picture and the repercussions as a result. And what about the shooter? What do you think about it? What do you think his friends are going to think? There's going to be families out there who's going to miss a father, a son, a brother, and they have to hold on to that pain. And now it's, it's directed to politics. That is one of the worst steps moving forward because of the psychology of radicalization. So the starting principle with the psychology of radicalization has to deal with something called an emotional breakthrough, or at least that's the, the best way to, to coin this instance or this phenomenon. So essentially, it's where somebody is susceptible to believing radical policies that they wouldn't otherwise support, and they usually wouldn't support it because it doesn't have their safety at the best of interests. This happens when somebody has received such a high level of emotional vulnerability that they're able to believe a policy that can curb their pain, even if it's not very intelligent. This happens for many reasons or many potential reasons that can all kind of clump together, be individually unique. But one of the biggest reasons has to do with the death of a family member. So in this situation, we can imagine what that would look like, which is this unique situation. Abroad, we can also view it from the Palestinian situation because there are family members, say a son was killed or a father was killed. And if they have statistically you know, six kids, that is an economic, uh, I guess you could say that the economic impact is so high to where those kids very well might die as a result of that. Going into the United States, it's not hard to imagine if your brother, your sister, your cousin, or anybody was killed, how that would change you. But the point is that that would leave you to a high level of emotional vulnerability that people can take advantage of. Next, this one's a little bit more similar to the average person. Loss of opportunity and an increase in hopelessness. So follow me on this. Right now in Portland, the unemployment rate is 14% allegedly in comparison to the 8% allegedly in the United States. The reason why I say allegedly 
is actually because uh, not just with the state and the federal administrations right now, but it's actually historically, the unemployment rates are usually skewed. It's just how it goes. Government doesn't have self-interest that are derived from getting the unemployment statistics right. A lot of times those are skewed. Usually it's 1.5 to two times the amount that they actually say. So instead of it being 14% in Portland, it might very well be up to 20%. So that is a type of, of break that would shift people into supporting more radicalization because what they have nothing to lose, but they have everything to gain is the point that I'm trying to make. Next has to actually do with homelessness, which I just did a video on this, interestingly enough. Now, in the Palestinian areas, there are some regions that people were displaced or homeless for two to three times already. And that's between a 2000 to 2004 period of time. Most of the influx was in 2002 during uh, this operation I will not get into. It has to do with the Israeli military. But that's when the increase in suicide bombings happen. Because if you have no job, you have no home, and your family members are getting killed, how do you think that makes you feel? It would, it would kill you. So in Portland, 33% of renters are on the verge of becoming homeless. That's 75,000 people. The only thing that's saving a lot of these people is the mortgage freeze that we have right now, the rent freeze. If it wasn't for that, a lot of these people would become homeless. Again, it goes back into the whole vulnerability aspect. They're feeling vulnerable. We need to take action. We have to do something as a result of this. Last, you have abuse. Uh, this one is... Um, Actually, I'm very curious about what your, your opinions of this one is. So, with abuse, the protests in the beginning to now obviously have changed. There's people who have never been tear gassed or hit, shot with a rubber bullets. None of those things have ever occurred. Now, I know a lot of you guys watching are going to say, well, that was self-imposed because they went to the protests. I'm not here to have an argument as to whether or not it's justified. I'm, I'm not here for that. I'm just giving you guys the, the real realities of the situation. And abuse is a huge one. And that's because your safety is compromised and it deteriorates your emotional well-being. So, for example, even with myself, where I had a police officer uh, come up to me with a right baton, so they're extra long, and uh, cocked it back like a baseball bat, and he was about to deck me in the face. And I actually had my hands up, and I, I was... He was walking towards me. I had my hands up and I just asked him, like, hey, I just want to know where you want me to walk. I'm trying to walk wherever you want me to walk. And he hit the camera guy next to me and he cocked back to hit me until I brought my camera up into his face. And I realized in the moment, some things can be justified, others cannot. He cannot justify that action against me because I wasn't doing anything. I also saw a girl get shot in the face next to me, a little girl get shot in the face with a rubber bullet. That has long-lasting impacts. And so when we're talking about having an emotional breakthrough, these are the types of situations in the United States that would do this. And so what happens as a result is then people start to wonder, what do I do with all of this energy? Well, a lot of times globally, they, they try to get more politically active, both on the local level and on the larger organizational level. Well, what happens if these people are politically disenfranchised and don't have a way to express themselves? For example... In the same period of time, 2000 to 2004, in the Palestinian areas, they started cracking down on local demonstrations where they started to shoot and actually kill people. And they started shooting at the cameramen as well. And so what happened is they lose their ability to, be, to empower themselves in order to make a positive change. So then you're left with the organizational level. Can you elect people that will better represent you? Well, what happened is the Palestinian governments were believed not to represent their wishes. And there are also controversies regarding where they're getting their donations and things like that. And so as a result, they elected Hamas. They had Hamas jump into government and they supported Hamas because it was as one individual who voted for Hamas had said, look, what else are we going to do? So when we look at uh, kind of the situation that we're presented with in the United States from the left's perspective, again, make of it what you will. I'm not here to have a conversation about whether I agree or not. Um, if you want, I can save that to another video. But what they view is, look, we have Biden who supported the crime bill and who has a corrupt prosecutor as a vice president. And on the other hand, we literally have somebody who brought the federal officers in here. Besides that, all we had was Bernie Sanders. Now, you can make the argument, well, you guys didn't vote for Bernie Sanders. And to some degree, you're right. Fair enough. 
but we don't have a lot of options. And then we also have an electoral system that has been historically rigged against us as well. So you have a high number of uh, instances which disenfranchise the youth. And so now we have all this energy from an emotional breakthrough and we have no way to push it to something positive. So what happens? It actually creates a culture of conflict. So let me ask you guys a question. Where does your comfort come from? All right. Now, whoop, excuse me. I'm like moving everything around here. I'm getting into this, okay? Where does your comfort come from? Do you feel more or less anxiety from being in your own room with no violence around you? The average person feels comfort from peaceful situations. Low anxiety environments is what we could call them. In a culture of conflict, comfort comes from conflict and violence because it feels more familiar than peace and stability. So if you wonder why there's so many wars in the Middle East, this is why. This is actually why. Now, in a previous video, I mentioned how culture of conflict is ultimately what we need to avoid because it's, it is something that is virtually impossible to undo. Now, one way we can avoid that is to elect the least polarizing president. Sounds like common sense, but it's, it's 2020. I'm not saying which one is more or less polarizing. I guess it depends on your perspective. I have my own opinion, but I'm not going to completely share that at the moment. I just kind of want to, you know, give you guys the, the objective truths here before I jump in with my own opinion. And so what happens here is imagine if the situation was somebody who was getting abused and they constantly go back to the same abusive partner and the abusive partner and another abusive partner. And the reason is because that system of abuse is familiar because it is anticipated as opposed to something that might feel more peaceful. And so when we have a, uh, excuse me, a society that is geared around conflict, when you have those modes of peace, it's anxiety inducing because you don't know what happens next. You have all of this pain and all of this resentment that you're used to now pushing into another field, the field of chaos. But when you're not doing that, you don't know what to do. And so that's when political leaders need to step up and they need to actually start addressing the real policies that are being proposed. That is what we need to do. And I'm not here to have a conversation about completely abolishing the police or anything like that, right? I'm talking about trying to find a way to be able to connect the bridge with the disenfranchised youth who don't believe that you represent them. How are you going to create policies that better represent them? And that's what we need to really have a conversation about. Now, full circle back to the shootings. This is really the tip of the iceberg because we, we are continuing to support people that approve of violence. And if we enter in this culture of conflict, look, you see things in the Middle East. What separates them from us? Right? So tying it all together, what we can anticipate is there's going to be more people who are going to support violence for views. That's just how it goes. I see not only politicians, but I'm looking at different celebrities right now that are are talking about the next civil wars upcoming and things along those lines. And I think it's because they are trying to create more popularity and avoid responsibility, I think is ultimately what it comes from, because they have more comfort knowing that they can send these things out on their phone and a lot of them are very wealthy, so they don't experience as much impact as a result of their influence. Now, usually in these situations, also, both sides do target the moderates. Now, I don't even mean the political moderates. I mean the individuals that don't support violence. So like me, I would not consider myself to be a moderate, but because I support things like Medicare for All, which I guess internationally I'd be a moderate, but I digress. But because I don't support violence, people like myself are going to be the ones that are going to be targeted. Next, what we can anticipate is there's going to be more zealots that are going to come out of the woodwork and come to Portland to try to raise more chaos. Now, zealot is somebody who either politically or religiously are kind of fanatics. Now, in the international scale, we call those transnational terrorists go from country to country. But the U.S. is big and we're seeing it more from state to state. So, for example, the Proud Boys or even people that show up at a state as a member of like Antifa and come here just to, to burn things down and, and attack people. A lot of times what happens is these people are more idealistic and they have no understanding about the local politics. They have no understanding about how to calm the locals down here. They have no understanding about what policy could you do on a local level to kind of just kind of quiet down the tensions enough to be able to have a conversation. 
These people don't have that understanding, but what they do have is they have the energy and the motivation to cause as much harm as possible. And these are the people that we need to watch out for as well. So I'm giving you guys a heads up on all of this. I know I've been talking for a while, but this is important. So as we look at the situation, we need to stop supporting violence, call people out, support things like nonviolent action, which is not the same as passivity. Nonviolent action is like MLK, those sorts of things. We need to support the MLK way and less the Malcolm X way. Because once this culture of conflict is started, which now we are on the right track for that, uh, it's difficult to undo. But anyway, uh, this is just an observation. Make of it what you will. Thank you.